We're going to be doing a very short intro scenario called Ex Libris, set in 1593. Good year for dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> Every year was a good rhyme, year or? for dysentery. <laughs> I think that's another Spinal Tap song. <laughs> <laughs> So does anyone have questions or do you want me to start? Let's do this. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to I'm going to set some stuff up and then um I'll have you introduce your characters real briefly. A little blurb about how you came to run afoul of the uh the act against conjurations, enchantments and witchcraft of 1563. <laughs> Here we go. We will start with the sanction of magic. When Elizabeth Tudor succeeded to the throne in 1558, she found herself under assault from all sides, challenged by the legacy of her family's actions. Henry VIII severed ties with the Church of Rome. He made himself an enemy of Catholicism. Later, Elizabeth's half-sister Mary sought to undo their father's work. Amid widespread religious reform, upheaval in the palaces and pastures of Europe, and the spread of the written word of Protestant belief, God grew distant. The barrier created by a wall of blind faith maintained over centuries by the church's strength wavered. The wider population saw the resurgence of bugs and the fae as a byproduct of the malefic acts enacted by the opposing sides, Catholics and Protestants. In 1563, the Queen passed an act against conjurations, enchantments, and witchcraft. It made magic use to kill another a capital offence, triggered in no small part by a Catholic plot to assassinate her through sorcery two years earlier. It also made a felony of the use of magic to maim, consort with spirits, provoke love, or seek buried treasure. In 1564, the Queen passed an amendment to the act on her most trusted advisor's advice. The D sanction permitted the practice of magic in defense of or for the beneficence of the realm, and it created a loophole through which convicted traitors might use their heretical knowledge to work a penance in service to Her Majesty. The sanction fell under the jurisdiction of both Francis Walsingham, master of the Queen's spy network in Europe, and Dr. John Dee, astrologer, alchemist, and companion in words to the Queen. They recruited the fortunate malefactors rescued from execution as agents bound to a covert intelligence service. The D sanction offered the first line of defense against inimical forces, both common and supernatural. So I feel like the fun part for the folks at home, it, home is uh, how much of this is uh, actual history? Oh, the, uh, the act against conjurations, enchantments, and witchcraft is true. The D sanction is mm -hmm. false. Okay, that's that's what you cucks go. believe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Soy beta bitches. Listen, this is alt history. Yeah. <laughs> Let's begin. In 1564, Dr. John Dee, astrologer, alchemist, and court astronomer to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, established a great library at his home in Mortlake in Surrey. A library so grand, it was viewed as one of the greatest centers of learning outside of the universities. This is true, by the way. In 1580, <laughs> while Dee was abroad conducting experiments and magical investigations with his scryer, Edward Kelly Lake was sacked, his library vandalized, and a great number of books stolen. Dee has spent the last decade zealously tracking down and recovering his stolen books many of which were copiously annotated in his own hand. All true so far. Wow. D has ordered you to travel to Deptford in search of one of these books, a copy of the Book of Dead Names. The paper trail, kept by his feckless brother-in-law, Nicholas Fromond, points to a house on the village's remote edge, known as the Gravel House. Fromond's intelligence states that the house's owner Renowned sailor and explorer, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, somehow acquired Dee's heavily annotated copy of the infamous book. Gilbert is believed lost at sea some 10 years now. His ship, the HMS Squirrel, went down off the Americas. Given its owner's fame, the house is well known in the locality, so should not be too difficult to find. You are to assemble at London Bridge at four of the clock on the morrow, 
travel to Deptford, locate the owner, and by any means necessary, retrieve what rightfully belongs to Dee. In return, Dee may speak favorably of you to Her Majesty and suggest leniency mm. or perhaps even clemency on your behalf. You do not wish to consider your fates should you fail in your task. Was uh, so I feel like I'm kind of getting tricked into learning things. <laughs> Oh, it's it's, it's, How it's, makes it's learning fun. It's all true so far. I'm not sure about the I'm not sure about the gravel house, but everything else I've told you so far is true. Hmm. Um, Sir that's, Humphrey Gilbert. That's awesome. Humphrey Gilbert is uh, kind of on the par with Sir Francis Drake, a renowned explorer hmm. and sailor. And uh, he's currently lost at sea. Presume, I, as presumed as presumed lost at sea. Presumed dead. Right. And and that's. Presume ten years ago. It's mm -hmm. it's been a minute. Nigh, nigh on ten he? years now. Or yeah. is he? Open your eyes, people. <laughs> okay. Shall we begin? We shall. Yeah. At four of the clock, you are all assembled as instructed at the Southwark end of London Bridge. An archery competition is underway, which of course has attracted a large crowd. You each wear a pheasant feather in your hats to make yourselves known to each other, for until this moment you are all strangers. The bridge is packed with life. Shops capped with houses line both sides of its expanse. They hawk wigs, jewellery, perfume, hats, shoes, breeches, shirts, ruffles, feathers, <laughs> silks, drugs, wine, spices, paper, ink, candles, toys, and anything else you could possibly think of. Perfumed and bejeweled ladies and gentlemen, likely coming from or going to one of Southwark's theatres, move amongst jugglers, sailors, blacksmiths, prostitutes, chimney sweeps, magicians, artisans, milkmaids, merchants, minstrels, pickpockets and muggers. A constant two-way traffic of horses, cattle and carts push their way through the crowds, their unavoidable dung covering the street beneath your feet and its equally unavoidable stench filling your nostrils. Above this ever-present throng are passageways connecting the buildings on one side of the bridge with those on the other. The impaled heads of traitors pecked by birds are a stark reminder that you should be careful not to become involved in politics. Children gaze enraptured upon them or try to squeeze past each other to catch a glimpse of prisoners chained to the banks of the Thames below, for the rising tidal waters wash over them. To the east and west of you, crowded streets wind along the river's embankment, and you can see the small wherry boats push out and ferry people for a penny east and westward along the river. Daniel Scroggs. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I can't speak a uh, very good Elizabethan, but I shall try. <laughs> oh, you don't need uh, to. So force don't need to at all. Good. Want to go ahead. I don't need to do that. My goal, my goal is to slip in one rhyming couplet at some point tonight. That's that's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have, experience well, I, I'm going to try to get. I have I have very uh, high hopes for that. <laughs> All right, hopefully uh, it'll come at a good time. So forsooth, my name is Daniel Scroggs, and I was once a royal messenger. Uh, I carried messages from king to, from kingdom to kingdom, all over Europe. Uh, but alas, I fell in with a a group of. Um, what is this group that I'm affiliated with? The Chevaliers de, de Troy and Postures. Uh, and they are intent in bringing enlightenment in an age of false religions. So I fell in with them and uh, was carrying their um, rather subversive missives um, against, against the saints and the, and the holy uh, scripture back and forth. And um, I was apprehended. And they judged that this, these blasphemous tomes uh, were the result of this group practicing occult uh, practices, I guess. All right. So that is how I, that is how I fell afoul of the, um, the, what is it, the Enchantments and Conjurings Act. Move along to Mr. Edmund Lake. So uh, Edmund is from a long line of once prosperous artisan artisans who... Uh, made a lot of money over the years painting and doing other artworks for monasteries and churches. However, after the dissolution of the monasteries, the work dried up more and more over the years. Uh, so eventually I tried my hand as an artist working for noble folk in London. 
it's hard to make money doing that. I ended up falling in trying to make contacts with uh, a small group of would-be enchanters. Turned out uh, Mr. Emerson and Mr. Palmer were actually sort of magical thieves. Not only were they seeking wisdom for their own benefit, they were scamming and thieving. And my artistic abilities actually helped a lot with counterfeiting for things to trade. Uh, and I got into some petty thievery myself. Uh, pretty quick, rival mages turned us in to the uh, to the authorities. I am the only one who escaped execution immediately just because of my youth and inexperience, however. And even that is sort of on the knife's edge. Wow. This is a god not, this is a god tier level character. Not, not, only, not <laughs> only did we get um not only did we get a lecture on the dissolution of the monasteries, but we got an Emerson Lake and Palmer joke. Well right. well done. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Mr. Leonard Snell. I present before you the cutting figure of a handsome man. <laughs> Sorry. And one whose business is to remain unnoticed. Often wearing dark and loose fitting clothing, I present myself uh, often whenever I choose to be seen as a second story man, a burglar. Whether or not you see me is, of course, an accident or intended. Okay, cool. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Walter Chase. Uh, yeah, Walter Chase is kind of a uh, tall, lean uh, scarecrow of a guy. He's got uh, uh, kind of long, greasy hair and a uh, real gaunt face. He is a uh, barber and a surgeon by trade. And uh, after uh, performing some not church sanctioned services, he has, uh, yeah, found himself on, on the wrong side of the law and uh, here before y'all. The end. <laughs> Thank you much. Thank you much. So, you're all assembled on the um, south end of London Bridge, which at this time is the only bridge spanning the uh, Thames River. And it connects the north and south sides of the sea. And you're at the Southwark end, in the uh, area of London, of Southwark, which is its main like theatre district and such. Um, you are, your destination is Deptford which is a village approximately six to eight miles to the southeast of where you are now. As I said before, the bridge is crowded with activity and the east and west of you, crowded streets wind along the embankments of the river and um, ferry boats push out every now and again to ferry people north and south, east and west, whichever way they want to go. So, what would y'all like to do? So, have we had a moment to introduce ourselves to one another? Absolutely. Excellent. I mean, can we hitch a ferry? You could certainly hitch a ferry. We're, we're assuming you all have, um, you all have petty cash on Excellent. you, so um, anything within, we can just assume that all of your characters can afford anything within reason. Hmm. Well, I, that we should we should take the ferry to our destination. Before uh, before we leave, though, uh, the the ferry, uh, and I'm I'm assuming it would it would just be a single ferry that we're hiring it's, and a single ferryman that's uh, that's taking us. It's called a a, a ferry. A ferry. Oh, it, it is a, is it, a small. Is it, it's a small boat. Usually, uh, has a two man crew, quite low in the water, can hold about four passengers, I think. Okay, so it's a taxi, not a bus. No, it would be a taxi. Okay. Before before we disembark, Leonard pulls the uh, pulls whichever one we were negotiating the business with. He pulls pulls the man aside and says, uh, "Listen, it's important that you keep this quiet. However, we we are on business from the Queen herself, and as such, we will 
pay you your usual rate, but we do expect some discretion and some expediency. Do you understand? The ferryman nods shakily. Good. Excellent. It's it's. Leonard t- t- sits down on the boat. Top t- 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 a man. So I remind you, uh, we're on the queen's business. Uh, a normal rate is a tuppence for two. It's, it's tuppence a man. Eastward ho, tuppence a man. You can each pay mm. tuppence, or you can walk. I I hand him uh, three pence. Yes, I'll kick in my share. I will. Okay, fair enough. I think I'll, it, I'll, pl- I'll play think good it, cop, and, and I'll tip him a little bit. All right. All right. I think at best we proceed with our business. Yeah. Him and him and his his other oarsmen sit down, and you kick off from the bank, and um, you're all you all settle down precariously into the low boat, and you start heading out southeast along the river. And the river is busy with ships and smaller vessels coming and going, sails cracking in the wind. Keys and warehouses line the north bank from the tower up to the bridge. There's a constant movement of porters taking goods up and down the narrow streets that descend to the river. Salt, coal, and other goods, such as fruit and shellfish, cloth, skins, and wooden barrels of all sizes. Human excrement, bloated animal corpses, and rotting food float past you, stimulating your olfactory nerves as people empty their chamber pots from their windows, mixed with the contents of dung piles, ditches, cesspits, and streams washed in by the recent rains. It was nasty. (laughs) Your ferrymen make good time, and you disembark at the convoy wharf at Deptford Docks, while there is still some light, though dusk clearly approaches. The docks Mm. comprise 30 acres, including two wet docks, three slips large enough for warships, forges, rope making, and other facilities. They're a hive of activity with sailors and dockers bustling all about you. You spy a group of dockers idling near some barrels engaged in a game of hazard. Uh, I would have, uh, as we were going down river, tried to chat up the ferryman uh, just in the interest of playing good cops. And uh, as we disembarked, I would ask them if they, if they might know the way to Gravel House. He uh, shakes his head and says, not from these parts, sir. Okay. Why not ask some of these sailors here? I certainly will. Hey, sailor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, should we talk to some of these locals? Yeah, I'll, I'll, certainly, I'll certainly approach the approach the sailors. Is anybody good at talking to people? Does anybody have a skill like that? Um, Leonard okay. Streetwise. Ooh, that sounds promising. We're going to at least play to our strengths here. I'm good at bleeding. <laughs> <laughs> Sailors um, probably need some dentistry. I'm good at that. If nothing else, we can trade dental services for information. No, I can't. So I'm not really uh, good at I'm any of hoping that, that chosen. That at this point, just finding the way to the house, that mm-hmm. shouldn't... Okay, as you as you approach the um, the group of dockers, one of them touches the brim of his hat and says... Good even, lads. The others glance briefly at you, then quickly return to their game. You get no sense of malice from them. Pardon me. Uh, my friend, my compatriots and I were wondering if you knew the way to Gravel House. We have business to attend to. The man that greeted you smiles a toothless smile. Barely, each man here he knows the Gravel dentist. House well, for it is the home of Sir Humphrey Gilbert. The other men mutter sadly at the mention of the name. Some here built his vessel, the squirrel, on thither dock. A fine gentle he was, too. Lost near ten year now. Another man pipes up. But if you have dealings, it be best to see Master Bull, for he be the one Sir Humphrey entrusted with the house when he was a-voyaging. And is Master Bull at the residence now, do you know? The dockers burst into laughter at the suggestion. And the first man (laughs) says to you, as we told those other fellows before you, Master Edgar Bull holds court at the Dog and Bell. There still be a flicker of light in the day, so he'll not be yet in his cups. Tis yonder down Dock Street a ways. He gestures to the narrow street which winds southwards from the docks. 
Oh, those other fellows. Other men. Were they the ones we were here to meet? Uh, who can you describe them? Oh, an elegant gentle and two other fellows seemed like soldiers. Arrived by boat like your good selves, not an hour gone. Filled with airs and graces he was, asking about Master Bull, speaking unto us like we was muck. The other docker laughs. So Isaac sent them on a fool's errand, ain't that right, Isaac? In sooth I did, the other man laughs. They'll be wandering the alehouses a while. Hmm. <laughs> to the alehouses, <laughs> friends? the joke. I, I uh, shake hands with the sailor, and uh, as, as I'm doing so, I tip him a couple pence. Oh. The men gladly take the coins. God yield thee, good lads, says Isaac. Tis truthful that ye will find Master Ball at the dog and bell. You'll know him by his one eye and foul humors. The other dockers <laughs> laugh as one, then return to their game. Is there a, a seat at the table for one shot at this game? Oh, for fuck's sake, Cam. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, don't, I don't care. I they can say no. Sure, you you can just... you can try your you can try your hand at hazard. Just let me let me go to Jan Google and <laughs> look up how to play. I'm sorry how to dude. play this game. Maybe just a quick intellect roll. I'll I'll roll I'll roll a d6 and and a five or a six is a win. Absolutely, yeah. And how much are how much are we? Okay. It's a it's a it's a penny in. What does it look like the buy in is? Okay, a, I'll buy in a penny in. Um, so first roll of the game, guys. Sorry. <laughs> the first roll of the game is Cam screwing around. Uh, five. <laughs> Great, you win. Okay. I'm, you win I'm the, what, you win the pot, richer? which is that. Yeah, sixpence. Let's say it's sixpence. Your, your sixpence won the richer. Ooh. Well, only a coward quits when he's ahead. Okay. Oh, God. No, I'm not going to keep going. No, I'm not. <laughs> I tip well, my no, hat to the to gentleman play. and uh, uh, join my compatriots who are quickly making their way up the street, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say first round's on me. Okay, so you start making your way down Dock Street into Deptford. And um, Deptford is certainly more pleasant to the nose than London. So pleasant is perhaps too strong a word. The place is divided into two parts. The upper village, where you are now, which comprises of narrow streets lined with an astonishing number of taverns and alehouses, all awash with dockers and sailors. A more pastoral lower village stretches off to the south and west with grander dwellings along the banks of the Thames. After a healthy walk, you spy the dog and bell at the corner of Dock Street and a narrow alleyway. Mm -hmm. On our walk, I would keep my eyes out for the uh, uh, other party that had arrived before mm -hmm. us, just to see if I see them mm -hmm. walking the other way down the street or something. Why don't you give um, me uh, give me an intellectual roll? <clears throat> okay, so that's a d6 for you. Just a straight d6. Yep. Actually, what uh, mm -hmm. do you have any um, abilities that may? I don't think I do. Okay, then just a straight d6 um, will be fine. Unless they, okay. someone, one of them needs some dentistry. <laughs> yeah, unless. <laughs> ah. Mm, no. I wasted the good roll gambling, guys. Sorry. <laughs> the um, no, the the streets are the streets are too crowded, and there's lots of um, there are some fairly unsavory looking characters, but none of them appear to be paying you any mind. Okay. Unless anybody else has other ideas, I I would just probably walk into the tavern. Here we go. Will, well, this is an alehouse. Or alehouse, rather. I'm sorry. <laughs> taverns only sell wine. Alehouse. Taverns only sell wine, and alehouses sell ale. There you go. Mm. I'm sorry. I didn't know that oh, either. We're learning. That. I'll, I'll, I'll do better, sir. I promise. We're learning. <laughs> taverns were frequented by um, healthier classes and sold only wine. Ah. Whereas uh, the destitute drifted towards alehouses, much like they do now. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you enter the alehouse. You enter, it, the Dog and Bell, which, if you end up in Deptford in London, is a real pub. Oh, yes. really? It's not. It doesn't go back to Elizabethan times, unfortunately, but it's got a great name. Oh. So the alehouse is small and shabby, little more than a one-storied cottage with a single drinking room. A ballad singer sits by the fireplace, singing "Send forth thy sighs." Customers amuse themselves playing cards and backgammon at tables, 
while others tend to the attentions of prostitutes. An elderly woman moves throughout the crowd with cups brimming with ale. In a dark and far corner of the room, obscured by a wooden column, a man sits alone. He appears to be writing in a ledger of some sort. When he briefly glances in your direction when you enter the alehouse, you are certain that his left eye appears to be scarred over. I think that's our man. How much of our true intentions do we need to reveal to him, or should we play it? Uh, we should close play to it our... cool, and maybe all. Are there four of us? There are four. Maybe yes. all four of us don't just like walk up and sit down at the table with him. Maybe a couple of us Wait, go hang at the bar I for have, a minute. I have, I have something that might help here. Yes. I'm not quite sure what it is, but since everything in this game is vague, I'm going to see if I can use it anyway and make something up. And Colin can tell me if I'm wrong in doing so. I approach this man and I ask him if his name is Master Edgar Bull. I be Edgar Bull. Who be asking? I have a letter for you and I take out of my satchel a sealed letter with Mr. Bull's name on it and hand it to him. This is interesting. I don't know what it says. I don't know what it says, but it was in my uh, mundane possessions. Oh, wow. Take that, Colm. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't, have a, you don't have a sealed letter addressed to Edgar Bull. Yes, I do. It says a sealed letter. It doesn't say it's addressed to him, oh. but it's a sealed letter. No. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not allowing this. I can't. I can't. Oh, come I can't on. allow that. I can't allow that. Why? It's going to throw the whole what? fucking thing. Okay, what fine. Do you, let's what do you, let's what do you, what do you think? What, what's in this letter? What's in this sealed letter to Edgar Bull? I don't know. <laughs> I'm a messenger. I don't know what people write to other people. <laughs> <laughs> who gave... Some okay, I, tell me. Okay, tell me, Master Scroggs. Who gave, yes. who gave you this letter? Who gave you this sealed letter to deliver to Master Edgar Bull? Apparently, Calm did. No. <laughs> Come on. The chairman and leader of the Chevaliers, his name is Jacques de Repure. Or perhaps maybe John D. gave you the letter. <laughs> shall, we, shall we say that? Is, is that going to throw your whole game or what? This whole thing is throwing my whole game, yeah. This whole thing uh. is throwing my whole game here. <laughs> Shall we just shall we just wipe that from 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 Craig's memory and? No, uh, I don't know. And, and do I don't know. Else? It depends what everyone what everyone else wants to do. It's a bit Deus Ex Machina for my liking, but. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, I wanted I I I wanted to be big and important, and here I am. Mm. You know. <laughs> so... All right, I mean, fine. What it's does the letter? Gandhi. I mean, what does the letter say? Give them the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, it probably says something along the lines of, you know, treat the bearers with courtesy and assist them. Oh yeah. What does is that not good enough? I mean that's vague, isn't it? Okay. Or like sort of letter of a generalized letter of recommendation from John D. Not necessarily addressed to this particular individual, but just kind of a like Yeah, why don't, why don't we say it's that? Treat the bearer nice. Okay, a yeah. Letter just, of introduction. Yeah. Yeah, just just cut all right, cut the rest of it okay. off, and I, I approach. Okay, I approach Master Edgar Bull and tell him that I have a letter from John D for him. How's that? Okay, that I can oh, okay. go with. Okay, and um, Bull breaks the seal on the letter and pours over it. Can't read. And um, <laughs> what a time to realize it. <laughs> make sure he hands the letter back, by the way. <laughs> He folds it. No, he I folds have a human it back up. I tell him it's his daughter's. He, stop. <laughs> <laughs> he folds it. He folds it up, and he hands it. And he hands it back to you. And he says, um, "What be your business with the gravel house?" Um, somebody else want to chime in here? I've already. I've, I've, I I've, think. I think at this point, uh, true to my word, I would have gotten a uh, a pitcher at the bar and uh, five mugs. And okay, uh, interesting. Uh, and you come over and and pour pour a beer for him. Okay, well, Walter. Yeah. Interestingly enough, as an aside, as you uh, approach the bar, you notice um, two men 
standing at one end, wearing cloaks. Mm -hmm. And you're certain that um, you glimpse under one of their cloaks some armor, giving you the impression that these men are soldiers. And they eye you warily, and as, as they see you approach the bar, both of them step away and immediately leave the establishment. Okay, then I come back uh, uh, with the pitcher and the five uh, cups, and I put them all down, and I will say, uh, gentlemen, I believe the time has come to uh, a uh, hasty flanking maneuver, let's call it, and uh, GTFO, I think we're about to have company. Yeah, I'll, I'll come up to the uh, bowl party. Okay, thank you. You want backup? I want backup. Sorry, okay. I had been imagining that I was taking the picture to the table, and right. So while you're doing yeah. that, I'm going up to join this conversation, and so we'll have a moment before you get there. Okay, that's fine. That's about yeah. right. Yeah. Um, again, um, Bull Bull asks, "What business have ye with the gravel house, Master Bull? We seek a book so that we shall not be beheaded by the behest of Mister D." I counted that out. It's totally a like pentameter. Boom. <laughs> I was. Uh, and I explained that Mr. D has charged us to find a book that he believed was in possession of Mr. Gilbert. And uh, we believe that, well, we could get into the good graces. And if it's a benefit to him, we'd be in a position to put in a good word for Mr. Bull if he found that useful at all uh, with uh, higher powers. Bull slams his fist on the table and says, uh -oh. Be you accusing Sir Gilbert as a thief? Not at all. We, uh, Mr. D believes that he bought the book under legitimate circumstances, but it, it may have entered the market under less ethical circumstances. Mr. Gilbert, from my limited understanding, appears completely blameless. But it might be best to get it out of his estate to avoid any suspicion from interested parties. Well, I be not the master of Gravel House. There be only one master of Gravel House, and that be Sir Gilbert. He entrusted the building's care to me while away at sea. And while it may seem folly for me to speak so, word being that he went down with the squirrel near these ten years past now, I still hold that trust sacred until the day he returns or his corpse be found. Hmm. In this one case, I think it might be a service to Sir Gilbert uh, to give us access to it and get this one item out of the way before it's discovered. I understand there may be other less scrupulous parties who might seek to tarnish his memory by finding it there. Or his memory, or he's still alive, and his reputation then. Yeah. Are you talking of heretics? I think there may be those who would frame him as such. <gasps> Boom. Yes, right? That would suck. <sighs> well, suck it. Bull disappears into thought for a moment and says, well, though, truth be told, the condition of the house being bereft of occupancy this long does trouble me, and I am many a time afeard for its contents. I keep the fires lit to keep the damp at bay, but many of Sir Gilbert's fineries are beyond my ken. His manservant Clement saw to such things. But he vanished after his master failed to return. Uh oh. Mayhaps it would be prudent to have persons such as yourselves examine the belongings, lest, lest any of them leave poor Sir Gilbert charged with heresy. Well, we would be most willing to do that. And we can report on the condition of uh, those belongings if you wish. What would your fee be for such a task, sir? Oh, no fee. We're uh, engaged in a charge of our own. Well, it's quiet and Think, that sound cool? Thinks for a moment. He asks to see the letter again. Scroggs hands it back to him. He looks over it one more time. He says, And Master D, Master D could speak on Sir Gilbert's behalf with Her Majesty. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Scroggs, do you think that might be the case? I think it is highly possible, yes, Mr. Lake. And he hands it back to you again and says, he just doesn't say anything actually <laughs> he goes he goes quiet <clears throat> and he reaches down and he produces a ring of keys and places them on the table and says mayhaps he made a veil of sir gilbert's house as thy lodgings for the night there be ample firewood and candles there 
Its contents be mostly under sheet, but Clement had straightened the bedding before abandoning his post. And he takes off a large iron key and hands it to Scroggs. And Scroggs sort of bows over the, the key and, and shakes his hand and says, we will, we will treat his lodgings as if they were our own. And Bull nods in agreement and says, what say we gather here again two days hence? And thou can relate uh, thy findings to me. I think that sounds a, a fair bargain. What do you, uh, what say you, Mr. Lake? Uh, that sounds uh, most agreeable. And, uh, and can we just quick get uh, the fastest way to Gravel House? Yes, directions. Oh, yeah. He gives you directions. Okay. And I assume now uh, our colleague is here with the ale. If I overheard just the last tail bit of that conversation there, I would quick put the cups down, pour one, two, three, four, five beers, and say, okay, let's have a toast. <laughs> and I would toast, and I would down my entire beer, and I would say, we have to leave now. <laughs> to Sir Gilbert's health. To oh, Sir Gilbert's to Sir, yep. Death, is, just death, to death is coming, but let's just, we, we only have time for one drink. Yep. Well, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I I I down it in one, and I'd say we have to go now. Okay, <clears throat> all right. I paid for the beer, and I said I was going to buy the first round. I mean, <laughs> you all make a hurried exit my from the Dog and Bell, and following Master Bull's directions, you head south down Dock Street under cover of darkness. As you travel south away from the shipyards and bustle of Dock Street, you enter the lower village of Deptford. Lower Deptford is a rural idyll of open fields interspersed with small, unassuming cottages. The houses become larger and more opulent as you follow a track west, until you finally come upon the gravel house, set amidst fields of maturing crops, and nestled along the bank of the Thames. The house sits dark, silent, and empty. All right, so we approach the house, and I produce the key. Anyone, anyone sitting with a, uh, a lantern on them, maybe? Mm, I do not. I have candles, or a candle. We probably don't need it right now. All right. Okay, I'm just curious. He did say, he did say there were plenty of candles inside oh, yeah. the house, so... Shall we go in, or does anybody want to uh, look around the out, the outside of the gravel house first? Do we see any sign of those thugs? No, you appear to be very much alone. All you right, know, then. honestly, uh, it's been a long day, and I probably would vote to just go in the place. Agreed. Yes. Yes. Okay. I approach the door and put the key in the lock and enter the... I turn the key. Okay. You all enter the house. Inside, it is in utter darkness. You appear to be in some kind of entrance hallway, but it's too dark to discern anything. Oh, uh, we're going to have to... Does anybody have anything we can uh, look around to find the candles? Maybe we should light your one candle yeah, there. Yeah, I can light mine, and then we can find more. Okay. okay. Lake I'll lights light his candle. Up. And um, sure enough, you are you take the uh, flint and steel from your purse and spark your candle to light. The weak, flickering light illuminates what is indeed the house's hallway, with a small closet to the right and doorways leading off to the west and east. You can also see that there are three heavy deadbolts along the top, bottom and middle of the door you just entered the house through. Should we lock it behind us? Yes. I would say lock one. Oh, in case we need to get out quickly? In case oh, we yeah. need to get out a little quick. You're right. Just lock the lock the middle one, maybe? I don't know. Sure. Ooh, man. Don't put too much stock Ooh, in that. Map. That's just a generic Tudor house map. <laughs> Ooh, generic Tudor house map. <laughs> Do, are, are there more candles on a side table in the entryway or anything like that, or lanterns on the wall that we can start lighting? Uh, there's nothing in, nothing in the hallway. Um, as I said, there's um, a okay. small closet to the right and then a doorway to the west. Uh, I would like to check the closet, if I may. Okay. Um, inside the closet, uh, you find um, some linens and some candles. Ooh. We'll grab those. Okay. We we'll grab the candle. Distribute. Okay. So now you all have lit candles. I would light a candle and pocket a candle if there are I, enough for that. That's a sensible move. Okay. And yes. you can you can use this you can use this map for really general layout of the house. Um, okay. So I found the candles. Who wants to uh, decide where we go next? 
I don't know what everybody else. What time is it getting to be here? Oh, it's probably uh, right now. It's probably 10, 11 o'clock at night. I don't suppose anybody brought a rotisserie chicken and a baguette with them, did they? No. Mm. Maybe we, said, maybe we, we should bought something just, at London Bridge. Right. Maybe we should just assume the bedrooms are upstairs and try to sack out for the night. Or do we want to go to find a library right away? Do, you, do we want to just look at that right away before bed? Y- yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It's been a long day. I'm tired. He's tired and snacking. <laughs> There's a pantry there. We're, we're, I, oh. I, yeah, it's the place has been... I, I would check the pantry as when we get over there, but we're not there yet. How long yeah, has we can check out the abandoned? library. Uh, about 10 years. There's probably some preserved food. About 10 years. Ugh. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, uh, what kind of... Um, this is maybe a little strange, but is there an unsettling feeling about the house, or does it just feel like an empty house? No, I mean, um, you check the uh, the drawing yeah. room, and the, in there was just... Um, a table covered with an ample supply of tallow candles and candle holders. And then the fireplace, mm. all of the fireplaces in the house have plentiful supplies of wood. None of them are lit. But just as Bull had indicated there would be, there are candles and, and wood. The house is basically, it appears to be very well furnished with, you know, grand furnishings, suggestive of a well-traveled owner. And niches decorated with statuary and keepsakes from distant shores. But um, Bull and Clement had covered everything with linen and sackcloth dust covers. But other than the candles and the, the wood, there's like the drawing room and the dining room and such that you've checked out, we will assume. Other than, other mm-hmm. than the elegant furnishings, there's nothing that you would particularly find unusual. Just the walls are covered with portraits of generations of gilberts does the uh night warrant getting the fires lit no um we i'm gonna say it's probably it's late may i think so it's quite pleasant then i would definitely uh just in case i have to get up and pee in the night uh uh you know grab a grab a fistful of candles okay um if that doesn't seem awkward okay so I, I would assume you all have candles are you planning on staying here yeah I, I i get like five i don't know that's i mean it sounds like uh mr bull had wanted us to stay here for the night i was leaning toward maybe seeing if we could ransack the book quick and get out of here and just meet with him in a couple days still but yes his his hope okay. is that we would stay here though if we leave here i don't know if fairies run all night like they may be stuck down here for now i mean if we if we find the book and leave then fuck it. We've already won. Let's just drink till morning and the fairies start running again. So I, I think that's Leonard's tack as well. I, he doesn't really care about keeping any kind of promise of keeping an eye on the house. Like it just, mm. it means nothing to him. So I think with all expediency, Leonard heads towards the library in order to find um, the book whose title is The Book of Dead Names. Book of Dead Names. Book of Dead Names. Correct. Thank you. Do we have a description of the book? It is, uh, or simply the title. It is the book of dead names, and it is um, heavily annotated in by uh, John D. in his own hand. Um, are you? Who is searching the library? Leonard I'd is be on board with that. Leonard, yeah, Leonard I, I and would Edward move Edmund. as a group. Okay, so the entire group is searching the library. Good. Okay, so you all quickly set to work examining the library's bookshelves which groan with tedious logs of voyages up through the 1570s and esoteric texts on navigation and ill-informed travelogues by affluent stay-at-homes. Several volumes appear to be missing, leaving gaps here and there amongst the shelves. They appear to have been carefully removed. You get no sense that the room has been ransacked. Okay, so... After spending a good deal of time searching, it is clear that the Book of Dead Names is not here. I wonder if there's a secret library somewhere in the house. Or if he's got kind what of a do the titles, staff somewhere. I'm sorry, somewhere. the types of titles we're finding on the shelves? Are all um, books on um, sea travel and navigation. And travel. And, and... I'm sorry. Are, they seem mundane, yes, I guess. Yes, very mundane. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's a secret library. Are you attempting like some kind of somewhere. supernatural investigation here? 
Hmm. No, I'm just looking at the like like they they all seem. I'm just wondering if if maybe this is the normal library and somewhere mm-hmm. else in the building there's like the the library of shit you don't want people knowing you have. Yeah, this guy's like an explorer and privateer, so maybe he had like some kind of treasure stash somewhere where the funky stuff is going to be. Yeah. Maybe in his bedroom. Well, I would think basement because that'd be really damp right next to the Thames if there even is a basement. Well, while you're thinking about that, you all become aware of the sounds Uh-oh. outside of the footsteps of a large group of men approaching the house. Oh boy. Gosh. Snuff out your candles. Good move. I snuff out my candle. We, are, we follow suit. They come to a halt, yeah, okay. and you hear what sounds like two men exchanging sharp words to one another. Um, can we hear what they're saying clearly? You would probably need to get maybe closer to, to one of the windows. Yes, okay. Leonard steals uh, quietly and silently towards the dining room window to uh, get both a peek at the, at the group of men talking in the moonlight and also try to catch as much of their conversation as he can. Okay. So you steal glances at the window and you spy what appears to be at least a dozen figures cloaked similarly to those you encountered back at the Dog and Bell. All appear to be armed with swords. The leader of these men grasps a visibly frightened Edgar Bull by the arm and yells at him. While it's difficult to discern all that's being said, the leader mentions monies that had been promised to Bull of demands half-kept and there appears to be mention of your party. He then pulls Bull sharply to him and violently shoves him to the ground. As the old caretaker crumples to the ground, a red bloom of blood blossoms on his belly. The cloaked figure returns his knife to his belt, and throwing back his cowl, you are shocked to see that the leader is none other than the playwright, Christopher Marlowe. That asshole. Rival (laughs) to Master Shakespeare. And some say a secret agent working for the <laughs> intelligence service of Sir Francis Walsingham. All true. Huh? Yep. I yell, Tamerlane sucks. Still fewer whisper <laughs> that he is in the employ of the School of Night, a secret occult society. Arlo barks orders at the others to ransack the house, acquire the book, and kill any who stand in their way. The cloaked figures draw Gosh. swords and begin to assail the house. The front door has a strong lock, but will not keep the mob out for long. Uh, well, it's got a strong three locks is what it has. So we only locked only one. one. We only locked one. Um, I I would suggest that there is no doubt a back door on this place. I think so. Okay. There's also we haven't even looked upstairs. There's a staircase. Yeah. I don't want to get trapped upstairs. Oh though. yeah, that's no, no. All that right. would be that would be Leonard's thing because he could sail out the window and rappel down the house or something. All right, here's a thought. There's some books missing, and we know that a servant went missing soon, soon after Gilbert did, and we had a name. So we want to get out of here, gamble that we'll try to find that guy and hope he has the book, because I don't think we live if we stay here. That's a conversation for 10 minutes from now. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't yeah. think we live um, if we stay here and search. Okay. I, I, we should I would at least say try... we start working our way away from the front door, looking for a back door. There, there's got to be a back door somewhere on this place. In the meantime, we could barricade the, the door. Then they know we're here. I assume one of you ha- is going back to further bolt the door, or are you all just searching uh, to the back of the house? They might break through any second. I say we just search for the back of the house and get the heck out. Yeah, we don't want them to know we're here. As you start making your way towards the back of the house, you become aware of the sounds of soldiers trying to force their way in through a door at the back of the house also. And it seems oh, very clear God. that you are surrounded. I would assume also that it's the 16th century, so none of you can probably swim. Uh, and there isn't a boat sitting out there on the on the little dock? There is not. Okay. Well, uh, then we either there... hide upstairs or downstairs. Have we found, seen a stairwell is. down, or are they all upstairs? Um, the stairway, the staircase in the main, in the, that you see there leads upstairs. They all lead upstairs. Okay, yeah, I don't think there'd be much basement here. Uh, upstairs and find a place to hide? <laughs> yep. That's the best thing I can think of. I, yep. I've got nothing else right now. Not. In the I moment. see why this is a short adventure. We all just die. <laughs> yeah. So you all get to the bottom of the staircase, and then I want um, each of you to just um, roll a 1d6 for me. We'll start with Daniel Scroggs. Just roll a 1d6. Three. Okay. 
three. And uh, Edmund Lake. That will also be a three. Uh, and Walter Chase rolls a four. Four. Okay. As um, you're making your way to the staircase off the main hallway. Doesn't matter. Walter, Walter's, Wait, Walter's managed it for us. Okay. I do have a quick question uh, about favors and esoterica. Mm -hmm. the, the, that's an ability that, that we have, correct? I apologize. I know that we covered this, it's but a, you, I need you reminding. You automatically get to use it. You don't, it is a, it's a one-time ability per session that you can use. You don't need to roll for it. It just, if I agree with it, it happens. Okay. And is the... Is this something that's like mystical in nature? Oh, yeah. Like I just yeah, I want to understand a, like how stretched a, I can get. It's a favor it. of the angels. It is utterly, but it's utterly like magical. Minor in scope. But very minor in scope. Okay, minor in scope is the important yes, part. Because you're not so, a wizard, example, you are I a schlub. I, I couldn't become invisible, but I could happen to find the like a perfect, like shaped hiding spot for myself. I would allow the hiding spot, yes, but no, you could not become invisible. Yeah, right. Yes, but then that would that would okay. you would yeah. never be Thank able you. to use it again for the game. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thank you for clarifying that. If we're good, let's go. As you're making your way towards the staircase, Walter Chase notices his candle flicker, then completely extinguish, and he senses a draft of cold air coming from the wall by one of the staircases. Ooh. And running your hand across the wall's surface, you push down and a sprung panel opens in the wall. And looking behind the panel, you can see a low room with a ladder leading down into a large hole in the floor. I'm going to say, uh, should we roll the dice with this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And I would assume that having popped it open, I've maybe got the best sense of how the latch mechanism works. So I'll send everybody else down first. Sure. And then I'll try to close it behind me. Absolutely. Great. Uh, yeah. There's a hand. There's a handle on the other side of the door, and it will. It will. It will latch shut. So you all go in. Is there a a bolt or bar on the on the inside? No. Okay. Thank you. You all go into this room. Are you descending the ladder, or are you all just waiting in this room for now? Oh, I think. Good. Well, I I think head down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so you all, yeah, so it's a very, it's a very small too. room. So you, you're all going in there. And then as, just as Chase closes the secret panel behind you, you hear the muffled sounds of the house's front and rear doors splinter open and the thunder of boots as the cloaked men rapidly disperse throughout the house. And you all carefully descend the aging wooden ladder, some 30 feet down into the darkness below. The ladder appears to be assembled from old ship's timbers. A musty, wheaty smell fills your nostrils and you find yourselves in a room some 25 feet by 10 feet and seemingly hewn out of the natural rock that form its walls. The noises above now seem quite distant, but you wonder how long it will take for Marlow and his men to discover your hiding place. At the room's centre, a large wooden table has been set for dinner. On the left sit the dusty settings for a meal with a candlestick holder, a cruet set, and a silver knife and spoon. The candles in the holder have melted down to nothing. A layer of dust settled upon them as with everything else on the table. A full-size statue of a dashing sailor type that, assume, is Sir Humphrey Gilbert, stands against the north wall and portraits of him young, adventurous and heroic hang in gilt frames. An elaborate maritime tapestry hangs on the western wall depicting a storm-tossed ship, presumably his vessel, the HMS Squirrel. Boxes marked HMS Squirrel, sacks, and old ship supplies are stacked about the place. Uh, there are no other ins and outs that are apparent? Other than the ladder, no. Okay. Uh, is, there, is the ladder bolted to anything? Is there any way of removing the ladder in case they find us? Um, you could certainly um, probably dislodge it from its, its moorings. It's like moored at the top where you began to climb down. It's like a 30 foot ladder. So it would probably take two of you to do it, but um, it would certainly prevent anyone else from coming down after you. So it might make noise, if though. you wanted to, um, if you wanted to, well, there's a lot of noise going on in the house. Hmm. So it's unlikely that they would hear it, but they might, you never know. Depends, depends how you roll. 
if like two of you could probably dislodge it. So, and that would be physical role. And if two of you are doing it, I would allow a step up on that roll. So you could roll one die higher than your physical. I, um, I myself am a very, I'm a very beefy boy. I would love to try to remove the ladder. Who wants to help me? Remove it in a way that you think we can put it back <laughs> so we don't all starve to death and eat each other down here. Right. Okay. Sure. I mean, I'm kind of generic at everything. If if everybody else is an absolute wimp, I, I'll I'll chip in. But I'm kind of a you know, short, stocky guy, so I'm not really. You know, I'm D four physical, so okay. yeah, I'm so, pretty slow. So Snell and Chase are gonna have a go. Yeah. Let's have a go. Okay, so and Snell will be the primary. Yeah, roll yeah. me a D ten. Oh, wow. Okay, it actually does step up to a ten. That's dope. It really do work like that, though. <laughs> I got a seven. Oh, nice. Nice. The ladder creaks, cracks, and breaks free from its moorings. And then you, you feel the sheer weight of it start to come down upon you. But fortunately, between the two of you, Snail and Chase, manage to um, hold it and lower it down to the floor beside you and lead it against one of the walls. So it is well clear of the hole. Nobody else, nobody else is coming down. Nice. <laughs> Do we snuff out our lights and wait quietly for an hour? Well, I was going to use the time to poke around and yeah. see if we could find his book. Yeah, there's a bunch of boxes and things yeah. and crates from the... So maybe, I don't know, maybe the case for being quiet for an hour and then looking. I don't know. Well, I, I, I'm more concerned about the searches. light because... If they if they do get oh, through yeah. the the door up there and they look down the hole and they see light at the bottom, oh, good point. Yeah. Whereas if they come over, they look down the hole and it's just a dark hole. If you heard anyone come through up there, um, I mean, you would hear them. Okay. Before they got a chance to see you. Okay. All right. Besides, so if I'm we hear keep anything on the door, everybody snuff your lights. Okay. Yes. So okay. can I look around for anything that looks like out like? supernatural or weird or anything like that to kind of expedite my search like okay that's just run of the mill treasure this is where he put his weird stuff i could have like you I'm i could have you do a supernatural role, but there's no, supernatural. There's no, yeah there's 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 nothing supernatural in this room i mean you know, okay. why why make your role if there's nothing here well i guess it's basically not even a sense that there's something Oh well, yeah. Well, you you oh. um. I tell you that you you sense you sense you sense nothing supernatural about um like the statue or the portraits or the tapestry or any of the um table settings. Everything everything seems just just old. Well, I guess I'd like to look through bags and stuff to see if there's some kind of big book in one of them. Or the markings on any of the shipping boxes, or. The boxes are branded HMS Squirrel, and um, there's scraps of salted meats and fragments of hard tack mm-hmm. in some of them. I know um, the the table, as I said, had the settings for a meal with a candlestick holder, a cruet set, and a silver knife and spoon. It seems like someone was staying down here. I I'm gonna can I do like an investigation check to see if there's any other clues as to what or why. Or if there's anything else going on in the room, a, a a secret passage out of this room, or anything like that. Um, sure, you could do a uh, intellectual. It's all the same. Sure. Do you have any um <laughs> abilities that may help them? No, I gave myself bleeding dentistry and ciphers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm rolling hot five. Oh, okay, very good. You don't really sense anything unusual but you do hear or at least you thought you heard the sound of um trickling grit or dirt from behind the tapestry Ooh, i will just with i'll just pull the tapestry away from the wall like two inches and shine my light back there just a little bit i'm not going to just rip it off the wall lifting up the tapestry reveals an opening behind Mm -hmm. it into a passageway about 10 feet high, 10 feet wide, and um, looks like it's at 
least 20 feet long, maybe much longer. And then at the um, center of it, like about at the what you think might be the midway point, maybe 20 feet in, you can see a kind of a, a weak light that's seeping through a hole in the ceiling. And the entire passage is um, filled with um, masonry dust and then a, a sulfurous odor. Um, I real I, I start waving everybody over, but before anybody goes in, I real quick look at the ground and uh, is there a thick layer of dust on the ground? Are there any footprints in the? There are no footprints. Okay. Good call. Um, no. everybody down for everybody down for seeing what's at the end of the tunnel, or at least if what that light is. Out. Yeah, I think we take off down the tunnel. Okay, and you leave it. You leave the um tapestry in place, or. Remove it. Yes. I think you did because I think you're going to do it sneakily, which is good. Okay. Yep. So as I said, um, the passageway is like filled with like choking masonry dust, and it's quite a strong sulfurous smell. And um, as you get closer to the midway point, you can determine that the passageway is indeed about probably forty feet long. And then at the at the center point, there appears to have been a collapse, and there's like a knee high pile of bricks and masonry and earth which doesn't obstruct you from moving along the passage and it's about it's about maybe two feet two and a half feet two and a half feet high and then above it there's a there's a hole in the ceiling where all of this masonry has fallen and um it's it's quite a small hole it's maybe maybe about a foot in diameter and um there is light seeping through there and you can hear um raised voices coming from somewhere above but i mean they're very they sound very very far away and they're um basically unintelligible i'm gonna point to my friend lenny and indicate that he might want to sneak up and see if he can take a peek at that hole and i do so okay so that's about that's about uh it's about eight feet above you. Think you can do that? You can. Can you climb the rubble? I. Uh, um, I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna say he's. Um. Well, you know, give me a. Give me a physical roll. I'd love to. I roll with a D8. Yeah. And I got a five. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Leonard uh, stands on top of the collapse, and leaps upwards and manages to um, get a grip on some of the uh, cracked and broken masonry in the ceiling. And um, he can just about get his head through. You can't get any more of your body through, but um, you can get your head through. Is the is the opening large enough for someone who has proficiency in um, infiltration, a uh, certain expertise with uh, getting into places that he really shouldn't be? Is there enough squeeze room? For no, such it's a, really such an only individual? it's really only big enough for a human head. But, okay. And as you get as you get through, and it's even even that you can only pretty much get right. it up to just past your nose through there. But um, you you glimpse that there's another okay. tunnel running above you, and it's lit by guttering iron braziers, hmm. and you have certain you can hear two voices in the distance somewhere in this tunnel, both raised in a clipped exchange, and there's a powerful sulfurous smell tinged with a tang of iron in the air here and as you're looking around you see right at your eye level and mm. just about touching your nose on the floor of the tunnel a large pool of fresh warm blood this causes you to spasm in fright which makes you lose your grip and your footing and you tumble back down onto the rubble pile onto the floor oh. below dusty embarrassed but none the worse for wear <laughs> Leonard stands up with as much. Your disturbance of the rubble pile say. reveals a silvery glint peeking out. You also notice a continuous trickle of what appears to be fresh blood leading away from the rubble before it disappears from view around a corner some twenty feet at the end of this tunnel. Fuck. Wow, that's a that's what? a lot of blood. What's the, the silvery, uh, silvery glint? I'll have a look. Hey silvery glint, how are you? I'm going up and looking at it. So Master Lake scratches through the rubble and you pull out the twisted and melted remains of what appears to have once been a slender silver bird cage. And upon closer inspection, you notice what appear to be glyphs 
etched into the cage's interior. Do I recognize them at all? Do they seem familiar from my somewhat brief magical studies? Your access to the knowledge of the Druids of the Eternal Grove makes you certain that this cage is of fey construct, as the silverwork is too mm. fine to be the work of men. May, may I take a look at it? Of course, I'll hand it to you. Does my expertise with ciphers or my Dagon uh, Griofa? Uh, your expertise with <laughs> ciphers? Uh, cryptographic, cryptographic guide. Uh, so this the the book that I know. Yeah, and your expertise with glyphs. You're gonna say you're gonna you say you're gonna try and uh, well, read these glyphs. Um, I would say yes. Um, yeah, I would, or do I recognize anything? Um, okay. I would be. Um, you can uh, give me a supernatural roll, and you can get a step up on that. So you would roll a d8. I believe. Okay, so a d8. I don't know, guys. The d6s have been treating me really well. Oof. Uh, a two on the d8. Two. Huh? Woo! <laughs> Boo. I should I should have just stuck with the D six. They've been treating mm. me really well. No, your your knowledge of glyphs is like is rudimentary at best, and um, okay, you're really not quite 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 sure what they are. Did you have an ocean, Mister Scroggs? Uh, Daniel Scroggs has read the Daemonorium, uh, which is a uh, it, it's it's a discourse on the theory and notion notional key in the identification and naming of demons, devils, and dark fey. I could take a look at it and see if it's any particular dark fey. Because uh, you said it's in the fey language. Okay. So yeah, I, I it over. You would just do a straight supernatural roll? Okay. Supernatural roll is... One. <laughs> nope. Nope, we all suck. <laughs> Should we... Keep moving down the hallway. There's yes. Let's proceed. Let's keep that thing, but maybe head down to the end of the passage or see if the passage keeps going further. Oh, and so we're following along the trail of the little stream of blood. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yep. There's no other real way to go. You follow the blood trail another twenty feet to the end of the passage, where it turns north and then it begins to snake for twenty more feet before coming to the bottom of a steep staircase hewn from the rock. At its top, you can see another fine statue of Sir Humphrey Gilbert. The blood trail continues up the steps. So hold on. So. At and this so point, do we. now that there's a blood trail, oh. are there footprints in front of us? Nope. There are no footprints. Okay. Uh, then I continue on. Because what else are you going to do? I do point that out. I just say no footprints. Okay. As you reach the statue at the top of the steps, you see that the blood trail continues along a 15-foot passage that branches off towards a candlelit chamber beyond. A very faint and distant tinkling sound emanates from that direction, almost completely overshadowed by much closer sounds of chittering and scurrying. Sneaky LaRue, you want to go check out the candlelit room? Snell <laughs> I is like fine. Sneaky LaRue, it's a good nickname for you. So uh, Leonard uh, continues uh, forward ahead of the rest of the group, trying to re- remain as unseen as possible as he proceeds into the next room. Uh, see what that chamber has about it. Um, the passage opens into a chamber lit by flickering candlelight. The air is filled with an acrid, smoky odor. The blood trail has pooled here, attracting dozens of rats, which your favorite, Jenny which dart across the chamber floor, what? greedily lapping at the crimson trickle. The walls are lined with bookshelves laden with tomes. At the chamber Ugh. center stands a large table scattered with tools, shattered glass, and the melted remains of what appears to be some kind of alchemical device. A heavy oak door, its locks smashed and broken, hangs partly open in the eastern wall. The tinkling sound seems to come from beyond it. Quiet, mechanical ticking, much like clockwork. Crimson Trickle is going to be my next metal band. Crimson Trickle. Uh, is Leonard able to step past oh, the, yeah, the rats no, uh, they just, fairly they, easily? They, um, or are they, when you are they get obstacle? close to one, it'll, it just scurries away. But then, you know, it returns back to the, um, to the delicious blood. Okay. So Leonard approaches the door cautiously and silently, and uh, provided that nothing... You know, unexpected happens. He cautiously opens the door. 
trying to peer into the room. So as you're much talking as about the, the room beyond? Uh, as he does so. Yes. You said there was the oak door, right? Seeing Leonard move around the corner, I slip up a little bit too. Beyond the door, it looks like an, uh, another 15 foot corridor. Um, there appears to be another door at the end of that corridor. Okay. Uh, head straight towards the door. And before opening it, I pause to see if I'm able to discern any movement or uh, any kind um, of sounds emanating your, um, from the room beyond. Doing all this, um, you hear a, a strange sound. And you notice that one of the rats lapping at the blood has begun to contort violently. And as it contorts, um, it's growing in size. And um, before long, it is um, about the size of a large hound. Jesus. And who's in the room at this point? So I'll I had made up it along. up to the yeah. entrance of the of the room for sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm. Yeah, I'm going to. Yeah, I'll bring up the rear. I'm going to um, ask you to roll for initiative here. And how this works is that one of you just rolls a 1d6. It's basically heads or tails. Four, five, or six is success. One, two, or three is a fail. I've been hot on the d6s. Go for it. Walter's been hot on the sixes. Okay, I'll roll it. One. Okay. Oh, rolled a one teen. We did. I started talking all hot and like I was tough shit. Yep. <laughs> yep. The dice hurt you. You're my dice bitch here. Was like, nah, not in my house. Yep. You, know, okay. you know, hot oh, dog. Can my we computer? have a? Can you give me a combat order? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say Cam made the roll, so I guess Cam's gonna be first, or unless you object. <laughs> sure. No, I don't object. Okay, and then who so, is who will be second? I'll go next. Okay. Do I have to fight rats? Yep. Wait, am I fighting yep. rats? Oh, God. Why, I Colin? Do why do you keep you're, doing you're this? Fight, you're fighting giant rats. I did it last time. Why do you keep... Why is it every single game, man? Every because game, it's the I got level like one rats. villain that you fight. That's like... That's like, can, we the... like a war... can we have a warthog yeah. or a killer cat or something? I mean, come on. <laughs> I'll promise there will be no rats to fight in Blades in the Dark. Thank well, you. We did. All you right. That yes, commitment. there will. Yeah, as long as I remember. Uh, <laughs> if you if you throw rats at me, I'm gonna. Uh, I just don't even know. All right, I'll go next anyway. Get it over with. Die of rat bites. Whatever. <laughs> Leonard. Yeah, so everybody else gets forward. bitten by the rats first. <laughs> well, there's only one large one at this point, right? Mm -hmm. I wanted to look at these tomes. We might have to kill a lot of rats to look at the tomes. How basically how combat works here is. It's a physical roll, both for attack and defense. The rodent of enormous size mm. is attacking Walter Chase. So um, <laughs> I need Walter to roll a physical die for defense. Six. My defense is a five. Very good. Um, the rat misses you and goes crashing to the floor, safely out of the so way, and is mom momentarily, momentarily stunned. It is now um, actually your turn. Cool. Can I use my knife? Does that does that grant me any advantage? Um, or is it, that just flavor? It allows you to stab it. Okay, so. then yeah, I I will stab it with a d6, I suppose. Okay. And it's laying down. Does that give me any advantage? Um. Oh, sure. Let's give it a d8 because it's momentarily stunned. Let's just step up to a d8. Okay, and I will try to yeah quickly dispatch it by slitting its throat. Okay. Via my uh, uh, barber skills. Oh, very good. Oh, actually, that would give you... That... With a two. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's not going to work. Actually, you even... Did you have... What barber skills do you have? You've... You're bleeding, right? I have... I have bleeding and dentistry. Well, I was going to say that it's, it's being basically stunned gave you a step up, but I would also say that your bleeding ability would allow you another step so i would have allowed you a, so i would then, allow you a d10 on that then, so let's just add two to your roll then i'm going to use my fortune you want to use your fortune i'm going to use my fortune a rat? why not i mean it's it's well it's 9 30. okay <laughs> <laughs> why not okay i came here to play Use your fortune and you can reroll that uh, so as a, a d10, a d10. Yeah. it's not my magic trick that's Don't what i'm saving it. 
Three. <laughs> that got you okay. above the fail. <laughs> yeah, that's good enough. Okay, um, you deal the foul beast a crushing blow, and its lifeless corpse expands to grotesque proportions and explodes, covering all and sundry in blood and fur. Uh-oh. The other rats scurry momentarily, then return to greedily lapping up the blood again. Oh, fuck. Can I just start stomping rats? Mm, you could start stomping rats if that's what you want to do. Or we can get the fuck out of here. Or you could do that. I gotta look at these tomes, wait, bro. Wait, 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 wait. I have, um, uh, in my mundane possessions, I have... That means I can stomp rats with them. Oh, you're good boots. <laughs> Your good Those boots. boots are made for stomping. These boots are made for stomping. I'm going to do it. Well, stomp them while, while, you were all, anyway. while you were all talking and having That's a good old laugh, uh, another <laughs> rat begins to squeal and contort <laughs> and grow to enormous size. And leaps. We should move down the hallway. And leaps towards Tom. Daniel Scroggs. And I need another initiative roll. Or, Can Scroggs give me an initiative yeah. roll? Yeah, roll high. I'm I'm doing my best. I'm, but it's a rat, so just expect it to be bad. Two, see. Okay, I'm good. The rat goes first. Um, give me a um physical roll. Well, it's a four. That's how to roll a d4. All right. right. Four. Hey. Okay. Um, the rat. Put that rat. Hurled onto Scroggs's back, but you managed to shake it off and knock it to the floor. Scroggs is up. If you want to attack. Or I am going to pull my knife and with an attempt to jam it into the rat's belly and gut it. Okay. Um, I will allow you a step up because the rat is once again stunned on the floor. So that'll be a D6. And I have, and I have good boots so I can kick it at the same time. D6. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I still think you should kick it. Dude, five. Do you have, a, well do you have a letter instructing you to kill it? Five. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I, have, I have a provocative hagiographic uh, <laughs> critique that I could read to it All and right. bore it to death. Bore it to death. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. As you, as you got the rat again, it just continues to expand and grow almost like a balloon. <laughs> and then again, just explodes, covering everyone. And everything in oh. the chamber with blood and fur. Oh, great! So we've got exploding balloon rats instead. Okay. Giant exploding balloon. Leonard opens the door. So I want to. I want to quick scan the, the tomes this and sucks. see if anything looks like it could be our thing. So hopefully we can just grab it and get the heck out of here instead of fighting one giant rat at a time. Uh, if I'm searching, could I use supernatural? Since I'm looking for a supernatural. Tome? Sure, you can do that. Or do I even need to roll? Is it just right there and I can grab it? Um, let's just say you search through all of the tomes and uh, the book of dead names is not here. And while you were searching... Oh, wait. <laughs> wait, I rolled a three, though. I, I think it is there. While you were, search- while you were searching, um, yet another <laughs> hound dog-sized rat comes just, just scurrying across the floor and leaps towards you. So can uh, I get an initiative roll from Edmund Lake, please? <laughs> we're gonna try to open this fucking door and then a rat's gonna attack me that's what's gonna happen <laughs> that is a two okay then i need a oh um, physical defense roll oh, as the rat the rat throws itself upon your body there you go that's what i'm talking about a four on my four. Oh, very good okay um okay you man you so my counterattack is that door open <laughs> yes the door is open my counterattack is the book's not here. Let's get out. <laughs> okay. I'm going to run through the door okay. away from rat room. Okay. I am. I am fine with this. <laughs> I am fine with this. This seems like a sucker's game. Let's get out of here. <laughs> okay. Okay. You all dash finally from the room, <laughs> slamming the door shut behind you. I assume. Yeah. Yes. And behind you, nice. behind the door, you can hear more sickening pops, mm-hmm. squeals, and bones cracking, followed by angry thumps as the other rats hurl themselves against the door. But it looks like it will hold. And at the end of a 15 foot yeah, corridor, the midway point stand two more statues of Gilbert. Modesty was clearly never the man's forte, in small alcoves on either side. 
The blood trail continues along the length Seriously? of the corridor, leading to another door that stands slightly ajar at the other end. The tinkling clockwork sound grows louder. Is there anything in those alcoves? There's just um, these two statues. Not books. Okay. Nothing at the nothing at the base of either of these statues, like catches or buttons or. No, both statues are exquisitely okay. carved from alabaster. One meticulously hand painted in vibrant, lifelike colors. Gilbert clearly had the means to commission the finest artists and sculptors. There's nothing remarkable about them other than their wonderful craftsmanship. Hmm. Okay. As an artist, I say they're not that good. I, I think we have uh, no way to go but forward. As we're it's doing my quirk is I'm supposed to not make decisions. Yeah. I just realized. <laughs> forward? Question mark. <laughs> yeah. As we're doing that, I pull Leonard aside and just in a real voice, I say, real low voice, I say, "Hey, if this goes really sideways and we need to make one of us drink some of this blood, I vote we make Edmund do it." Hey. Only well, way to find I'm not out. sure what that if, would if if the soldiers find us, we can make him drink the blood and 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 he can fight them while we get away. I guess we did all just meet that today, so we're work. not too attached to each other. Exactly. Uh -huh, <laughs> and then no, we can hang it on the hall. About any of you. That was just a bit of flavor. That wasn't... And at the other at the yeah, other, yeah, at the other end of the hall is another um, wooden door, um, and it is uh, again slightly ajar. And as you draw closer to it. The clockwork sounds grow louder, and you get a um, a rank odor of rotting flesh begins to fill the air. Oh, gross! Oh, I mean, I don't think there's much of a choice. If there's so only just, forward, you, you I just, must go you're forward. just opening the door and entering the room. You want to peek through there first? Hmm. Very cautiously, uh, very slowly, and as uh, surreptitiously as possible. Peering, peering through the door, Leonard spies a candlelit chamber of similar size to the one you just fled. At its center is a table set with two chairs, at which sits a man in servant's garb. He sits with his back to you and appears quietly preoccupied. Um, you can see that there is an open hallway off to the right in this room, through which the blood trail seems to continue. Leonard is going to attempt to sneak up behind the gentleman Place his hand over the the man's mouth, his other arm around his neck, and attempt to just keep him subdued. Okay, can you can you give me a give me a give me a physical roll on that? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. And I got a two. As you enter the chamber, you can hear a distant, heated conversation between two men from the hallway to the right, and um, you quietly approach the seated man. And come to a halt to his right. You put your hand over his head, one hand on his head, and the other around his mouth. Did you say? As, as you, as you. Yeah, I like you know. As I'm you go to, to take, like, as you go take to take hold of him and keep him, him from screaming. Um, you notice that there is an overpowering stench of rotting flesh from him, and though he's dressed in servant's garb, you now see that oh. this man is uh, merely a monstrous construct of clockwork and flesh. He sits quietly, playing both hands of a game of Knave Noddy. No, Cam. Pushing counters back and <laughs> forth between himself and the empty chair across from him, based on whatever the winning hand is. Such at this point, at this knave. point, at this point, at seeing this, this hideous construct, I need you all, each of you, to make an unraveling roll, which is a, which mm. is a 1d8 before we continue. My number is good. Ah. Four is I hope good. Hope a high number is good. Two is not and good. Two. Great. <laughs> oh, seven suspected. is good, and a six is good. Oh, so six. Scroggs. Oh, that was my seven. Sorry, Scroggs. I thought that was my no. two. Scroggs. Huh? Scroggs gets to gets to unravel. Okay. Well, let's see. Let's see what we'll. Wow, the rats didn't do it. Let's. See. Wow. Okay, you can't believe the rats didn't do it. No. The rat won't do it. The rats just got you warmed up. Uh, Let's face it, some of it is still the rats. Quickly, where is my unraveling? I'm glad your cat's there to help you, Jenny. I know, I just posted that, didn't I? I just saw that. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta tag all of you guys. Forgot, but because, because I was too busy getting unraveled over here. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I need you to roll a D8. 
scribes. First of all, we'll see what's going to happen. A six, oh. the immediate effect that you get from your unraveling what? is the yellow bile. Your character is filled oh. with bitter rage towards all of their allies while in the presence of this fear source. Garbage. So what do I do? Like just stomp around hating everyone or? Um, I need you to roll a 1d6, uh, which is take a chance. So flip a coin. So I just need you to roll a 1d6. And that's a four, and that is not that is a success. Mm, you're fine. Um, if you had failed, you would have had to act in a selfish way, which would persist in the presence of the fear <laughs> source. So right now you're just filled with rage towards your allies while in this room. I also need you to roll a d. I also need you to roll a d6 for an <laughs> ongoing consequence. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> uh, so this is the Call of Cthulhu part. It's Call of Cthulhu part. A one, fat-witted. You act carelessly. You lack reason when making decisions. You can now add that. And you're in a rage at us? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you can add, well, that, you can add that to your injuries and afflictions. That will go away. What, that will go away. What's it called? Um, Fat-witted. You Fat act carelessly wasted. and you Fat-witted. lack reason when making decisions. That will last for the duration of this game. Okay. Wonderful. I think we're way ahead of that. The rest, the rest <laughs> of you, the rest of you, however, are fine. Okay, so you're you're in this room with this um, hideous clockwork man, who appears to be playing this card game by himself. Um, there's a, a open hallway to the right, and you can hear voices coming from that hallway to the right. Uh, I thing, okay. So there are it, voices from the hallway to the right. Is that what yep. you said? Yep. In did my the, oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Did the clockwork man notice Le- Lenny the sneak at all? He does notice you. He turns his head slowly towards you, and he seems to um, look you all over. A faint smile, sort of, rather grotesque, appears on his mouth, and then he um, kind of slowly and sadly turns his head back and just resumes his game. That's weird. Leonard smiles back and looks to the rest of the group and just uh, kind of moves. Uh, you, mm-hmm. you said that there were uh, there were two men arguing down the right hallway. Okay. Uh, I, I cautiously approach the hallway to the right, keeping a little bit of a present mind on our our good friend, you the card player. You can't player. help thinking that the, the card player might be... Um... Clement, or the remains of Clement, Sir Gilbert's servant, servant yeah. based based solely on yeah. his attire. Um, not both so, well. all right, I'll bite. Uh, I'll talk to him. Are you, like quietly, I'll say, "Are you Clement?" And again, the clockwork man clicks and wears and slowly turns his head to look at you, and nods slowly in the affirmative. We need a book from your master, Sir Gilbert. Do you know where a special book might be? Worth a shot. His eyes appear to well up with tears, and he slowly shakes his head and turns back to his game. Okay. Yeah, worth a shot. Who's at the hallway to the right? Oh, that would be Leonard. The angry conversation can be heard between two men. You can't discern all that's being said due to the echo of the long corridor before you. But one of the voices sounds terribly familiar. Listening closer, you hear the unmistakable voice of Christopher Marlowe. His tone is one of anger, and the other man's or of despair. Does it sound like the two of them are alone? Why, that's a weird question. Is... Just, I don't detect the sounds of uh, of other um, of other people, right? There's, like there's it's not no, just for Marlo, um, there's, someone there's, else, there's and too then much, ten there's guys. There's too much echo. There, there, there does appear to be like another sort of sound going on, but it's certainly not um, a large group of men. No. Okay. Uh, I I whisper to the rest of the the group that uh, Marlo seems to be here, and he appears to be alone. It might be a good uh, chance for us to uh, ambush him at least. Get rid of the, the other competition. You're kill Christopher Marlowe. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Somebody has to. <laughs> Hell yeah, we are. 
Uh, question. <laughs> now that I'm out of the room with the clockwork fear guy, uh, am I still filled with bitter hatred towards everybody? No. Okay. You're not. Right. Everyone loves you now. Okay. Uh, mm. Every, no, well, I'm not sure everybody loves me, but I, I at least <laughs> love them But now. I, I love you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Walter. <laughs> You're welcome. I think I might have spoiled this for myself by Googling uh, yeah. Christopher Marlowe. Uh... I love the fact that you think <laughs> it's going to be you, yokels. Wow. <laughs> Christopher Marlowe died in death I mean... in 1593. <laughs> under ah. under mysterious circumstances. <laughs> Stab him. This is awesome. Well, well written. Well written. Good fun. Entering the hallway to the right, the air is filled with a sulfurous odor tinged with a tang of iron. The corridor runs approximately 40 feet lit at regular intervals with guttering oil braziers. The floor looks fire-scarred and shattered, with a head-sized hole surrounded by a spider web of cracks at about the midway. Oh, I remember that one. Just ahead of you on the left, a slightly ajar, one secret door reveals some steps leading downwards. At the far end of the corridor, you can see the shadows cast by brazier light of not two, but three figures. Two appear to be men, the other a smaller creature that darts frantically about the other shadows like a monkey. The blood trail continues along the length of the corridor. Hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a breaking point to me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> 